Hello, this is Thomas Donald Jacobs for Paperboys on Thursdays, and um, I know it's been a while, <laughs> a, a real long while, since I have made a vlog, um, but I'm in the last year of my PhD, so I'm struggling to write my dissertation and experiencing all of the existential dread that comes with doing a PhD, especially in your last year, where you're like, does this matter? Who the fuck's going to read any of this? Um, what am I going to do afterwards? Am I going to be able to find work in my field? Um, because doing a PhD does not guarantee you a career. Um, yeah, it's a lot. And then uh, a lot of family drama on top of that in the last couple of months, which often sucks the life out of me, and I've been ill. So, yeah, it's been a while, but forgive me, got a lot going on, okay? Um, however, um, something's been making me mad, <laughs> so I thought I'd vlog about it. Uh, those of you familiar with my collection of um, no production value videos here <laughs> are aware that that's often what inspires me to make one. Um, which incidentally is why I don't mind if someone calls me an angry trans rights activist. I'm cool with that. Um, anger is often very appropriate and legitimate. Um, often, if you're not angry, then you have not been paying attention. Or you are dismissing something that doesn't affect you, so good for you. Um, other people, however, got shit to deal with, so I'm gonna deal with some shit here. Uh, something I've been wanting to talk about, um, and it just recently come, kind of come to a boil, is transphobia in academia. It's something that I've experienced, and it's made me really question... Um, whether I want to continue in academia at all sometimes. Um, in my experience, uh, which is obviously not going to be everyone's, um, there's kind of like three kinds of transphobia in higher education. So first is what I would kind of call like structural transphobia. And that revolves around things like transgender people not having access to research that is about us. That's not right. Um, that's also the case for a lot of minority groups that are uh, objects of study and not participants in the pursuit of science. Um, that's a problem. Also, um, a lack of uh, qualified persons teaching topics dealing with uh, transgender subjects. That's a problem. Um, it's good to expand uh, course um, possibilities to add more topics, give students more options. It's less good when um, you're kind of treating topics as like throwaway topics um, instead of hiring qualified people to teach the subjects. Um, I wouldn't say that's so much a problem at UGent at the moment, uh, but it definitely has been in the past and it's very much a problem in other places. Um, so that's a structural issue. Uh, another structural issue, um, the inability of transgender people who are a marginalized group who are often in the lowest economic brackets of, because of discrimination, um, an inability to access higher education. And then also administrative issues, you know, trying to get your student or staff ID card updated with uh, a recent picture in your actual name, for example. 
uh, those are old problems. Some of them at my university at least have improved. Some of them have been easier to deal with than, than others. For example, the admin one I'd say is like a really easy one to get people on board with uh, just because in general, if you have a complaint about administration, people are going to be on your side because no one likes administration at universities. Um, sorry for the people out there working in admin, but y'all just ain't popular. You know that. Okay, I'm not saying anything that you ain't already heard. Um, all, all issues which need to be dealt with, um, and they're difficult, um, and disheartening at times, but they're not really troubling on a sort of like interpersonal level. The other two types of transphobia that I've experienced in academia definitely are troubling on a, you know, face-to-face -face basis. Um... So the second type of transphobia that I've experienced, blatant in your face. I don't like transgender people because you either don't exist and or are mentally ill and are evil. Um, I wish I could say that that wasn't a thing that I experienced at my university, but it was. Now, I want to make it very clear. By far and away, the vast majority of my colleagues have been nothing but completely supportive. And that has meant a lot to me because I've known so many of them for so long. Uh, many of the people that I work with now um, were my professors when I was a first-year bachelor student. They have known me a very long time now. <laughs> um, so... It was like a huge relief when I came out and nobody was like, get the fuck away, okay? That's like a fear that people have when they come out, especially to people that they've known for a long time. No one wants to be rejected by people they've known for a really long time. You don't want to lose those relationships with people that you like. Um, but that being said... Um, I had a couple of colleagues at my university, um, a research project that I was uh, engaged with, um, conferences that I go to regularly, <laughs> who were in my face, I don't approve of you, and I am not going to show you any kind of respect as a human being. Um, now, that's awful. But I will say this, at least here in Belgium, if you have the self-confidence to speak up for yourself, it's not something that you actually have to put up with anymore because there are labor laws. Um, you can't treat people like that in your workplace. You just can't. Um, so there is, you know, a legal... Um, an administrative way to deal with that kind of thing if you have the confidence to speak up for yourself. Um, you don't have to put up with it, and you shouldn't put up with it. Did it improve my relationships with those people? Well, no, obviously. Um, what, were the, what were the options? Agree with them? Be like, I will try to meet you in the middle on this issue that concerns my actual just existence. Like, there's not a lot of give and take to be had there, is there? It's not a negotiable, fungible topic. <laughs> um, and also, Belgian universities, like many others, um, tend to come down on that kind of thing now because it's not a good look for the university. Um universities publicly at least whether they live up to it or not is a different question but publicly at least want to profile themselves as embracing diversity it's good for attracting students um so that sort of thing is very frowned upon and um if you speak up about it at least here will be dealt with um The last kind of transphobia, though, 
is something that I find a lot harder to deal with um, because it often flies under the radar. And it is transphobia um, masquerading as science, basically. Um, This is the gender critical, okay. Now, there are a lot of other vloggers um, on TransTube <laughs> and elsewhere who have um, covered all the different variations of um, the gender critical, what all fits in that, um, what the various issues with these things are. Um, if you're not familiar with the gender critical stuff, basically in more everyday language, you may have heard it referred to as turfdom, turfiness, the turfs. Um, it's bigotry. There's no, there's not really <laughs> a lot of leeway for interpreting it as anything else when you examine it closely. Um, there's a particular type of gender critical nonsense that really gets on my nerves. Um, so just to give you an example of one of like the broad streams within um, the so-called gender critical, um, I don't know, what do you call it? Cult? Um, a sort of biological essentialism, okay? Boiling it down to gender may be a thing, it may be partially socially constructed, but at the end of the day, what really matters is your biology. Um, there's a lot of problems with this. Uh, for one thing, as a former university biology student, I'm aware that the biology that they're presenting as being essential, the essentialist part, the essential part of being a woman, the essential part of being a man, is um, not actually how uh, these things work, which is why you generally find gender critical people not in biology, okay? Um, people who actually study human biology and uh, sexuality and DNA, you're not gonna find a lot of gender crit people in there uh, because shit's complicated. Um, for example, junk comes in more variations than boys have outies and girls have innies. Um, there are other kinds of junk, okay? Uh, same thing for chromosomes. There is more than XY and XX. It just is. Those are the ones you hear about when you're a kid and you're being told things in a simple way. Um, but when you grow up and you study the subject, you find out no, it's, it's actually a lot more diverse than that. Um, so that's like, like one of those problems that the way that they present biology is not how biology is. Um, another issue with their biological um, essentialism, I'm not sure <laughs> that it is... Um, a way to organize society because it doesn't reflect how people actually interact with each other. Um, for example, when I walk down the street, people do not interact with me on the basis of what's in my pants, obviously. They have no idea what's in my pants. They might guess, but they're probably going to guess wrong. Um, they don't know what my chromosomes are, and I doubt they're spending much time thinking about it. Um, and if they guessed, they'd probably guess wrong. About, the only thing they might guess correct is that I'm queer as a $3 bill. That'd be a good guess. And the rest would just be pure and 
I am betting for the most part, totally an accurate speculation. <laughs> we don't interact with each other on the basis of what are your chromosomes. It makes much more sense to ask people what their pronouns are than to ask them what their chromosomes might be. If for no other reason than that most people don't know what their chromosomes actually are. They're guessing based on what they observe of their own phenotype. But phenotype and genotype often don't line up in the way that you might expect them to. Genotype being your actual DNA. Phenotype being how the DNA is expressed. Um, although often with some outside influences, as it turns out. Um, epigenetics is an interesting field. <laughs> you should look into that. Um, a lot there on gender and junk, too. Um, th those things don't always line up, and we don't understand all of it yet, even. So, promoting biological essentialism as a way of shitting <laughs> on the tiny, tiny, tiny minority of transgender people. Um, there's no other way to describe it except as unscientific. And when people persist in it, despite being presented with loads of evidence demonstrating why this is a nonsense, a stupid thing to do, and that they don't even know what they're talking about when it comes to biology, persisting in it makes it clear that it's bigotry masquerading as science but it's like science is like five-year-olds understand science so yeah that kind of gets on my nerves um it also upsets me when i see people in the humanities especially anthropologists and historians do this the two fields that i am most familiar with within the humanities um One, there's nothing within the historical record to support this biological essentialism. This is a really modern kind of discourse, and it's not a very clever one. Um, I mean, you find sort of analog ideas, especially in the early modern period, but the early modern European view on uh, biological essentialism and i.e. the inferiority, the inherent inferiority of women. Is that like what we're going to model our modern discourses and how we interact with people on? I'm going to go ahead and say not a good idea. Um, <laughs> there's plenty of other societies, both past and present, that offer us other models. Um, for conceptualizing gender and human interactions um, that are not male, female, based on junk. Um, when a historian or an anthropologist pushes this idea of like the two sex model with all of the biological essentialist nonsense around it, I kind of feel like you might not be so good at your job. You might want to do a little more reading, you know. Um, also, it's just an inherently weird concept to me that people with a PhD, grown-ass human beings with a PhD, are on their way to getting one, who have experience teaching a class, especially the first years, And who are therefore very aware of the fact that what you learn in elementary school and middle school and high school, everything prior to the point of entering university, was presented to you in an extremely simplified way that in no way reflects often <laughs> the complexities of history and human societies. Um, often, uh, you have to correct things that students were told that were just flat out not true or filling gaps um, 
that were just, you know, they had to be left out because there wasn't time or the teacher didn't really um, feel like it was important or the people who construct the curriculum didn't feel like, you know, this was a thing that needed to be covered at that point. Like all these things, you know, when you're at that level of academia, you are well aware that there's a difference between what you're told when you're a kid and what you're taught at university that you would then yourself fall back to your, you know, childhood understanding of biology to justify your bigoted point of view. I just find that fucking weird. <laughs> like, you know what you were taught in elementary school about biology probably was, you know, had about the same relationship to reality as what you were told about history at the time. Why would you do that? Um, yeah, so that's fucking weird, and I don't understand it, and I, you know, would rather not see people do that. Another thing um, that I don't like is when people get called out for doing this kind of thing, and this isn't just limited to gender crit people in history and anthropology, you know, the two fields that I'm most familiar with and where I see it. Um, it's like a broader phenomenon, um, that I've seen other, in other places. People get called out on their gender crit bullshit and they will try to back off of it a little bit and they will turn it into a sort of false equivalency. They'll be like, oh, well, you know, I think that transgender people have legitimate concerns, but so do the groups that are against them. Um, I don't think that's true. I think there is data, like actual data, collected by people working in criminology, for example, showing that um, transgender women, especially transgender women of color, are extremely, extremely likely to be the victims of targeted violence. Um, there's data collected by gender specialists working in the medical field, um, doing actual data collection in actual clinical settings, um, using actual research methodology to show that gender, um, transgender people, um, suffer mental illnesses largely as a result of social non-acceptance. Um, same for high rates of suicidal idealization, um, especially among younger transgender people, um, being the result of the same thing, non-acceptance, uh, not being trans itself, but how other people crap on you. Um, all data-driven. All research, published, peer-reviewed, accessible, especially if you work in a university and you have access to your university library and PubMed, which we do. Um, where's the data on the other side of this? I see a lot of, we have to protect women, by which they mean cis women. They don't give a shit about trans women. We have to protect cis women from the scary trans women who are uh, going to enter women's spaces and take the opportunity to sexually assault them. Um, data, please. And um, data, by the way, is not the plural of anecdote. Um, finding one or two instances of shitty trans people is not data in that equation. So they're just, they're not equivalent. Whereas you can have concerns that are based in reality and then you can have concerns that are based in imaginary fears. And um, one tends more towards bigotry than the other. Um, so that irritates me. And it's something that I have seen gender crit people in academia do. 
And leading on from that, there's the final fallback when gender crit people in academia are called out on their crap. And it is like the last resort fallback. I'm just asking a question. It's my academic freedom. That's cool. Okay. Academic freedom is important. But if you're going to ask an academic question, shouldn't you ask it in an academic fashion? Um, we spend a lot of time in our history department talking to students about how to properly formulate a research question. And that does not involve simply copy pasting something that you saw on Reddit or you uh, saw a, a, like a blatantly transphobic opinion piece um, someplace or you saw something by Prager U. <laughs> And just being like posting that uncritically or handing it in on a paper if you're a student and being like, that's my research question. I'm just asking a question. That's, that's not a research question. That's not asking a question. That's you repeating something that you saw uncritically, which is uh, kind of like the opposite of research um, in a scientific setting. So that last thing is something that really gets on my ass. Um, and it's something that I think my colleagues and other trans people's colleagues should be more aware of because they often let it slide. As soon as somebody says, I'm just asking a question and brings up academic freedom and waves their you know, academic credentials around, everybody backs off. People will immediately step off. Um, no one wants to engage in that debate by pointing out that what you're doing is not academic um, at that point. Um, you didn't cite anything from academic literature. You cited an opinion piece full of misinformation that you would have discovered with two seconds of academic searching was debunked um, or things that are so blatantly made up with no evidence or, um, you know, research like Lisa Lippman's or, or uh, that ridiculous survey that was published by the BBC that does not meet even minimal standards of actual scientific research. Um, I feel like it shouldn't be just down to trans people to point that out. Like that's an area where our colleagues could step in and give us a little support and say, you know, cause you don't even have to point out that it's transphobic. You can just be like, that's not research. That's not an academic question. You're not, you want to ask an academic question. You gotta, you gotta, you know, follow the rules of academia, um, which means doing a lot of pre-research Formulating a research question means doing a lot of research first. <laughs> that's, that's how we avoid asking questions like, I want to research whether there were cars in the 17th century. That's how you avoid that. You got to do some, you got to do some background reading first. Um, you know, I feel like my non-transgender colleagues could uh, do that. If they're not comfortable calling someone transphobic, and I get that, no one wants to do that, especially to a colleague. No one wants that kind of problem at work. I get that. Um, if you don't want to do that, you could just be like, you're, you're not really presenting the best of your research skills here. Um, for me, additionally, I find it concerning when people do that kind of thing because not only does it indicate that maybe their research skills aren't the best, but it also makes me worried for their students. If their uh, position at a university or a research institute 
includes teaching duties. I mean, um, bigotry isn't a hobby. It's not your stamp collection. Um, and it's not your dog or your cat. You can't leave it at home when you go to work. That shit goes with you wherever you go. So I'm going to wonder if I see someone doing that kind of thing, if they are capable of interacting with transgender students in an appropriate fashion. Yeah, I'm going to wonder and I'm going to worry. Uh, I understand if my non-transgender colleagues don't want to suggest that kind of thing. Um, no one wants that kind of hassle. But at the very least, if you want to be an ally, you could point out that when someone's like, I'm just asking a question, and they're waving around their academic credentials um, while doing so, that, you know, they're not, in fact. They're hiding behind their academic credentials. Um, that's, and it's kind of fraudulent, <laughs> okay? Um, we don't have a problem doing that in other areas. You, you know that? Like, I'm a historian, yes. And I have several very narrow <laughs> fields of interest and expertise. Um, I'm qualified to talk about certain things. Now, certain things with academic skill and an ability to cite literature and give a nuanced picture and context. Um, and I can sketch the background of the arguments um, and where certain people have gone down, you know, straight paths that didn't lead anywhere in terms of the research or which were later corrected. That's a lot of work. Um, and I respect my colleagues who have put in that work in other areas. My credentials as a historian does not entitle me to stray into those areas without doing the prep work that they've done. You're not going to see my happy ass on TV talking about current events in Eastern Europe. Um, I have an opinion, sure. I have lots of opinions. But I am self-aware enough to know that not all of my opinions are well-founded, okay? And are not for consumption by a broader audience under the guise of my academic expertise. Because I don't have it in that area. Right? If I went on TV or I started showing my ass, running my mouth, and making really, really offensive and ignorant remarks um, about a particular minority um, caught up in current events in some fashion, and uh, one of my colleagues who is an expert in that particular area of history and politics called me out on it, I'd have to back the fuck down. And if they wanted to be like, yo, dude, that was super unprofessional. Um, maybe you are in the wrong line of work. I'd have to eat that up. Um, Cause that would be true. So maybe if you're a historian or an anthropologist or someone else working in the humanities, um, Keep your views about transgender people to yourself. Or don't present them, at least, under the guise of, this is my academic point of view. Because you, in fact, don't have an academic point of view. So, yeah, those were some thoughts. That was some ranting. Um... I don't know if anyone's going to watch this entire thing or at all. Uh, if you do, you know, let me know. Hit the like button. It's the first time I've asked people to, like, hit the like button so I know if anyone's watching this shit. <laughs> and if not, I'll keep doing it anyways because I like to rant. Um, and it made me feel better. 
to get that off my chest. So I will hopefully see you soon. Um, take care, make good decisions, and um, till next time. Bye.